The Pied Piper, this fairy tale first became popular in Germany and later evolved into a classic European legend. Many literary works have drawn inspiration from this tale. The tale is set in the German town of Hamelin. A long, long time ago, Hamelin was suddenly infested with rats. The townspeople were at a loss. At that time, a piper dressed in colorful clothes appeared, claiming he could get rid of the rats, but he demanded a hefty fee. The people agreed. The piper took out his flute and began to play softly. To everyone's surprise, rats from all over the town flocked towards him, following him closely. Led by the piper, the rats then jumped into the river and drowned. However, when the piper asked for his fee, the townspeople refused him. That night, a melodious flute sound echoed. All the children in the town were drawn to it, following the piper into the distance. Eventually, the piper and the children disappeared into the night. Only a lame child lagged behind and was not taken by the piper. I don't know if everyone feels the same as I do, but the story of the Pied Piper feels quite eerie. It doesn't seem quite appropriate for children. Later, I discovered that this fairy tale was actually based on a real historical event, the somewhat tragicomic children's crusade of the European Middle Ages. The crusades were initiated by European Christians, aiming to reclaim the holy city of Jerusalem from Muslim control. In total, there were about nine crusades spanning two centuries. The farcical, children's crusade took place in 1212, between the Fourth and Fifth Crusades. After the failures of the earlier crusades, a belief began to spread within the church, the reason for these failures was due to impure thoughts and weak wills. Even virgins would become promiscuous during the crusades. Thus, only the pure-hearted children could truly rescue the holy city of Jerusalem from the hands of the infidels. Amidst such public opinion, a Pied Piper emerged. In 1212, a 12-year-old peasant boy from France named Stephen suddenly claimed that he had received a divine revelation. An angelic messenger instructed him to form his own children's crusade to liberate the holy city of Jerusalem. Stephen wrote to the French king of the time, hoping to gain his support, but the king paid no heed. Stephen did not give up. Instead, with his extraordinary eloquence and innate religious leadership charisma, he attracted a large number of followers. Moreover, with the encouragement from churches everywhere, many religiously zealous parents eagerly sent their children to join Stephen's ranks. Soon, the seemingly absurd children's crusade grew to a staggering size of 30,000 individuals. Most of them were boys under 12, with the youngest being only 6 years old. After assembling in Vadom, they set out for Jerusalem. The journey was not as wonderful and smooth as they had imagined. Lacking sufficient logistical support and a standardized military structure, this 30,000-strong force quickly fell into dire straits. The rations they brought were soon consumed, leaving them to beg or forage for wild plants along the way. Many collapsed, but even more chose to leave. Stephen and his loyal followers did not falter. After countless hardships, they finally reached the port of Marseille. These children seemed to see hope. They imagined Stephen would part the waters like the prophet Moses, allowing them to pass safely. However, as time ticked by, the waters of Marseille port remained turbulent and unyielding. The miracle did not happen, and these followers were profoundly disappointed. The flame of faith in their hearts gradually faded. The majority of the children decided to return home, but around five to six thousand chose to stay with Stephen in Marseille, waiting for the miracle. Perhaps their devotion moved God, two Marseille merchants approached them, offering to provide ships to take them to Jerusalem for free. Upon hearing this, Stephen was overjoyed. In his eyes, this might be another form of a miracle. Soon, seven large ships set sail carrying these children. However, their destination was not the holy city, but hell. Two of the ships sank shortly after leaving the port of Marseille, burying all aboard within the belly of the sea. The remaining were transported to the Islamic slave markets to be sold into slavery. 
Coincidentally, in the Cologne region of Germany, another Pied Piper emerged, luring children. This boy, named Nicholas, was almost a replica of Stephen, also claiming to be guided by God. What set him apart from Stephen was that while Stephen aimed to conquer the holy city with swords, Nicholas wanted to enlighten the non-believers with words. Throughout history, every instigator possesses a certain charisma that surpasses the ordinary. Even though the tragedy of the French children's crusade wasn't that long ago, under the astonishing eloquence of this German version of a young prophet, over 12,000 fervent followers quickly gathered. Fortunately, these followers were older than those in the French Children's Crusade, with an average age exceeding 15. Among them were also some of the poor and vagabonds and prostitutes. Their experience was almost a replica of the French Children's Crusade. The fervor of faith was gradually replaced by hunger, exhaustion, confusion, and death. Some fell on the road to the Crusade, while others chose to return home. By the time this children's army passed through the St. Bernard Pass and reached Genoa in Italy, only 7,000 of the children's crusaders remained. They also faced the barrier of the sea in Genoa, and Nicholas, like Stephen, clearly didn't possess the superpower of Moses. Unfortunately, they did not encounter kind-hearted merchants like the French children's crusade, so the journey of the German children's crusade ended there. Some of them were attracted by the prosperity of Genoa and chose to stay, some returned to Germany and died on the way back, some were captured by pirates and sold as slaves, some continued to head south, looking for an opportunity to sail out to sea. As for Nicholas, his whereabouts were unknown. Some said he died in a snowstorm on his way back to Germany, others said he crossed the sea in southern Italy and reached Jerusalem, and even participated in the Fifth Crusade. When a very small number of people returned to Germany and told the truth about what had happened, people were furious. They believed that Nicholas had deceived everyone, so they hanged his father. After that, the dark fairy tale of the Pied Piper, which I mentioned at the beginning, began to circulate locally. Unlike the fairy tale, what lured these children wasn't the sound of a flute, but the so-called divine decree. The two children's crusades ended like a farce. Some claim that these children were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they quoted scriptures from the Bible as proof, a little child shall lead them, you have ordained praise from the mouths of infants and sucklings. Of course, many more believe these children were bewitched by the devil. However, no one realized that they were neither moved by the Holy Spirit nor tempted by the devil. What led them to their deaths was the fanaticism of extreme faith and the ignorance of the soul. Of course, Saying that the Pied Piper and the Children's Crusade are related is just speculation. Their commonality is that both involve large numbers of children disappearing. Moreover, the Children's Crusade took place in 1212, and the legend of the Pied Piper is believed to have originated in the 13th century. Part of the Children's Crusade started in Germany, and the legend of the Pied Piper is rooted in Hamelin, Germany. However, after many years of research and verification by some scholars and experts, the truth of the Pied Piper story may be as follows. On June 26, 1284, this Pied Piper, named Nikolaus Spiegelberg, led 130 youngsters from the city of Hamelin to migrate eastward to the Pomerania region along the Baltic Sea. Nikolaus Spiegelberg was a bearded, kind-hearted old man, who once served as a local immigration official in Germany. Around 1284, he frequently traveled between Hamelin and Pomerania. His two brothers, local administrative officials responsible for transporting immigrants, once settled near the city of Hamelin. According to historical records, when the 130 children went missing, Spiegelberg also disappeared around the same time. On July 8, 1284, Eleven days after the children's disappearance, Spiegelberg was seen by eyewitnesses in the port of Szczecin in Germany, an essential port for migrants at the time, approximately 250 miles from Hamelin, coincidentally a journey of around 10 days. In the 13th century, many densely populated German towns had numerous emigrants, with the vast eastern region referred to as the Promised Land. This region was rich in wheat, honey, and meat, making eastward migration very appealing. 
The local Slavs and Hungarians also welcomed the German immigrants, as their arrival would strengthen their defense against Russian invasions and plundering. As a result, encouraged and supported by the nobility, the number of German migrants heading eastward increased. Given this historical backdrop, Spiegelberg leading 130 children to migrate eastward was a common occurrence and nothing unusual. Unfortunately, during their migration, the ship they were on sank near the coast of the Baltic Sea. Spiegelberg and the 130 youngsters perished, with no survivors. Regarding the story of the Pied Piper using a flute to lure rats, experts have verified and scientific experiments have confirmed that this is entirely feasible. The high-frequency sound from the flute can make rats' nerves tense and create disorder, thereby enticing them to rush into the river and drown. Historically in England, there were individuals who used a tin whistle, rat catchers used the high-pitched trembling sound emitted from the whistle to trap thousands of rats. During the Middle Ages, when Europe was plagued by rats, it was entirely plausible and not surprising for a roaming rat catcher to use the high-frequency sound from a flute to lead rats into a river to drown. The truth behind the story of the Pied Piper has various interpretations, with no unified conclusion. We will bring you more fascinating historical stories in our future videos, so please be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to watch them. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing as it greatly helps us. This is the History Microfilms channel, and we'll see you in the next video.